Hello everybody and welcome back. It's lovely to see you again. Now this we're calling a chatty vlog. It's Friday night, well at least hopefully it's Friday night. Today is Wednesday. I'm hoping that I've got enough time to edit the video before getting up on YouTube on Friday. And I've talked about the principles and elements of design before, but I've got a lovely arrangement in front of me. It's not one, it's not the style that you've seen me do on the YouTube videos before. But I thought it was a really good one to show you and um, help you get to understand the elements of design a bit better. We're going to try and demystify those elements of design. And I've created a design that's very long, low, quite a contemporary design. You see that it's in this rectangle melamine base and I've got a quite a vibrant colour combination in there. I've also got quite a lot of water in, which has decided to leak out everywhere. Now, it's quite a vibrant colour combination. It's not everybody's choice for a floral design. And of course, one of the elements of design that you hear me talk about a lot is colour. For me, colour is very subjective. Different people appreciate different colour combinations. And this choice of flowers here is a complementary colour harmony. So it's colours that lie opposite one another on the colour wheel. And in my case, it's orange and blue. So they lie directly across from one another on the colour wheel. And it's what we would refer to as a colour harmony. Now I have a colour wheel. We've looked at the colour wheel before. And if I just show you, this is orange here. And then if we go directly opposite, you'll find blue. And that's what we refer to as a complementary colour harmony. So again, if we look at the colour wheel and we look at the orange and the blue, then the outside colours are the true hue. So they're, they're the colour in its full density. And if we come to these shades here in the middle, these are tones, tints and shades. So we've added white to make it a paler, we've added grey and we've added the dark black which will give you a more rich and darker colour and that's how we get tints, tones and shades. And if we look at this design, this is a really good example, if we think of all the oranges that are here in this arrangement, we've got a very dark vibrant orange, if I just grab one of these carnations, so this is just standard orange carnation and it's a really rich orange so if you can imagine we started off with an orange color and we've added black to it you will end up with this deep orange almost a terracotta in its color and then if i compare it with the rose which is on the opposite sort of end of the spectrum this is what we would get by adding white to our original orange color so we would have a pale color we would have a pale combination alongside that very dark color um, so this will be something that we would refer to as a tint and that's when we add it to white and this is when we add it to black. And then when you add it to grey you get all different colour combinations in between. Um, so we, we think about mangoes, a citrus orange, a tangerine. Um, I've listed just a few down here to help my memory. Of course there's apricot. If you think of honey that's a very orange shade as well. Then I've listed brown and rust. Spice, amber, if you think of cinnamon, that's definitely a brownie orange shade. And then you can go all the way through to bronzes and coppers on the other end of the spectrum. And if we think about this colour combination at Christmas, this is quite often where I refer to it as. At the moment, we've got lots of Christmas decorations that are in coppers and you have a steely grey matching it as well. So, you know, if you're finding it hard to process, those two colour combinations together. Look and research Christmas decorations, Christmas tree decorations, because that colour, that copper and the, um, those metallic short shades are really very popular at the moment and it will give you a really good example of how these two colours work together. And again, if we think of orange and we think of workmen's vests or work ladies' vests, I should say now, that really fluorescent orange and then you go right to the other end of the scale where you've added lots of white to the colour, then you get this very soft apricot mango sort of colour as well. So it ranges in a huge colour combination. And then if we think about the blue, so I've got a mid sort of range blue here at the moment, and this one is an iris, 
and this one is a garden iris it's quite a soft head uh, it's not as robust as the florist grade iris but I wanted to be able to show you these two colour combinations together but again if we think of the blues and we go from pale shades of blues you get greys very very popular at the moment in interior decorating pale blues then of course we've got royal blue navy could be denim or just sky blue then there is of course sapphire um, navy I think I've mentioned if you look at stones if you look at aggregate there's lots of different shades of greys and blues within the aggregate um, if you look at spruces at Christmas different types of conifer they've also got that gorgeous blue tone and of course eucalyptus that's one of our really fashionable foliages at the moment and that comes in a vast ray from a very pale grey to a greeny grey uh, so all different shades of blue so hopefully that gives you a little bit of an insight into how colour combinations work and if you're learning about colour then I can't recommend enough going to visit a DIY store and picking up some of their colour paint swatches that you can um, quite easily get hold of or look at interior decorating, look at how colour combinations are used together, look at fashion, see what colours are currently in fashion, how we change through the season, um, how wedding flowers change with the seasons as well. And obviously now we're in the, the spring, early start of the summer, it's the beginning of June, we're looking at more pastel shades of colours for bridal designs. Whereas when we move to the autumn, it tends to become these more richer colour combinations, browns, oranges, golden shades together. And then as we move into Christmas, we tend to become more festive and we have lots of reds or even whites, silvers and greys all put together. And, you know, you've just got to keep looking at pictures, things that inspire you. And what I like isn't going to be uh, this colour combination that somebody else might like. So hopefully that helps you a little bit more with your colour combination. Now one of the other elements of design is form and shape. So we're going to talk a little bit now about the difference between form and shape. And again, I've got some flower combinations here to discuss with you. Now if we think of shape, shape tends to be two dimensional. So we think of drawings that we might put on a flat piece of paper. So there's rectangles or circles, triangles, they all tend to be flat. So if I show you um, the container that I've used today and if I just hold it up for you straight so you can view it straight on, it's a two-dimensional shape. It is just a rectangle but if I turn that on its side so you get a different angle of it, it becomes three-dimensional and that then becomes a form. So forms are always three-dimensional. So a flat shape has a length and a width. I'll just turn that that way. So a flat shape has length and it has width, whereas a three-dimensional shape has depth or height. It has width and length. And if you go back to school, if you think about three-dimensional forms we think of boxes um spheres pyramids um what else is there cones that was the other thing i was going to do talk about so your shape starts off flat and two-dimensional and then it becomes three-dimensional where it has height widths and lengths or sometimes depth whichever way you refer to it as so in a flower design Sometimes we create an overall shape which will be three-dimensional. So it could be in my case like this, I've ended up with a rectangle shape design. Hopefully we won't get water leaking out everywhere again. Oh, it's not my day today. So we get a three-dimensional design. And again, if we look at it from the top, it's very flat and it's two-dimensional. And that's often what you see when you take a photograph because photographs tend to be two-dimensional. Whereas if we look at it from the side, and if I slightly turn it so you get the side view and the front end, my overall shape becomes three-dimensional. So we go from flat, from looking at it from the top, to three-dimensional on the side, 
So we go from shape, which is two-dimensional, to form, which is three-dimensional. So what I started saying, and that, just balance that back there, what I started to say was your flower types are often flat and can often be two-dimensional. But when we place them together into a design, sometimes we create an outline shape like the geometric shapes like triangles, or sometimes they're more free-forming and more loose like a crescent or a semi-crescent shape. But often the individual flower types can themselves be quite flat. So if we just look at a gerbera, <clears throat> I'm going to show you a gerbera from the side. Bring it over here so you can see it against the plain wall. From the angle you're looking at it now, this top section is almost flat. It doesn't have a great deal of, of three dimension to it. But if we angle it slightly in different positions and if we bring the head forward slightly, we see it from different perspective and it changes the way we look at it. Where again, if we look at it straight on, it's flat. It doesn't have any dimension to it. So this is what we would refer to as a shape. Whereas if we turn it to the side and we have some movement in the stem, it becomes more three dimensional and has a more interesting overall shape to it. Now, if we look at a rose, <clears throat> this is quite a big headed rose and I've got two roses here to look at. This one is far more open. And then we've got a pink one just alongside it. And again, if we look at them from the top and we look down on them, they're almost flat, almost two-dimensional, but if we turn them from the side, again, they have height, they have width, and they have depth, so they become far more interesting. We have volume to them and depth, so that's a far better example of form and three-dimensional shape. So I hope that makes a little bit more sense to you. I've, I've also got here um, on my side, this is a bulrush, I couldn't think for a moment then what it was called. And again, I'm going to talk about this in just a second when we talk about line. But again, that's very flat. It doesn't have a lot of depth to it. It's quite a flat piece of material. Um, but it is a really good example of line, which is why I've got it here to talk to you about. Um, so we start off often with flat flowers. Foliage quite often can be very flat. And then we build up a design which has height, width and depth, which gives us three dimension and makes our eye travel through the design, makes it far more pleasing to look at than something that is very flat. So we've looked at colour and we've looked at form and shape together. Now I'm going to look at texture and texture can sometimes be a bit of a minefield. It's a quite hard for your brain to process all this information but texture can come in two forms and it can be visual or it can be actual texture. Now if we think about an artist's painting sometimes there is a little bit of texture in the paint if they're painting um, using quite deep strokes. Sorry for all the artists out there I can't explain it uh, without, with the correct terminology. But if you think of a flat painting, an artist has to be able to create visual texture within that design. It has to make that cactus or that pineapple in that arrangement look like it's spiky, but without actually being spiky. So an artist has a really difficult job of making that picture come alive, making the textures three-dimensional making you want to touch them and feel the spikes of that pineapple top. Whereas in floristry and flower arranging, we do have textures within our flower material. Some of them are textures that you can feel. So if I just lean over and get this cactus from, in, from my side. Now, we all know in our heads that cactuses are often spiky. So this isn't just spiky to feel, but it is visually spiky as well. We know that's going to be spiky to touch. Um, whereas an artist has to create that texture within the drawing. And 
for me as a designer, what you look for when you're creating a design is different textures within the design, within the flower arrangement itself. So we have spiky textures and then I've just got myself a peace lily and you can see that the peace lily has a far glossier texture to it. It's smooth, shiny, there's a great deal of texture within that one leaf itself. And I'm just going to chop it off so we can talk about it in a bit more detail. So if I hold these alongside one another, this is flat. It is very smooth, it's far more calming and far re more resting, makes your eyes stop and rest. Whereas we think about this, it's very busy, has a lot going on, it has, it has lots of bumpy pieces, lots of spiky pieces, it moves up and down. So it's what we would refer to as something that's very busy. So we have something very busy, something very flat and very calming. So often when I'm describing how I put a design together, you'll hear me describe textures, glossy, flat, spiky, um, velvety, that's what we use quite often, and lovely velvety texture. I'm just gonna move that before I end up spiking myself. <clears throat> now, of course, actual texture is something that you feel. And, it, you know, when you think of clothing, you might have a leather skirt that is shiny to touch. You might have a jumper like this, which is more warm to touch and more comforting to feel. And flowers are very much the same, and so are your containers and any accessories that you use. Um, you could have a rough texture, something could be smooth, soft, sometimes things look a little bit slimy, and sometimes you can have something that has a sticky surface. So when you touch it, you have the tactile quality of the flower material. Then of course visual um, texture is how things appear to be, how you observe those textures, it's what you see. So again if we think about that cactus, we see it as being spiky, we see it as being prickly, as well as feeling it to be prickly and spiky. And often with visual texture, um, visual texture can be created by shading, lightness and dark. It can be a pattern within the flower. So again, if we look at this carnation here, there is a dark outside frilly edge to this deep, deep orange carnation, but it's slightly lighter in the center. So we have a, a visual pattern that's creating texture within that flower. But we also have actual texture in this beautiful carnation because the edge is frilly. So it's given us a frilly texture to the um, flower. Now, if I look again at this carnation, the carnation, oh, sorry, that's not a carnation, that's a gerbera. It's been a long day. So of course, there's almost an illusion there of color because we have the variegation in the petals. Um, it looks smooth almost flat so again it has a very two-dimensional quality to it so quite different to the carnation and these two often work very well together alongside one another because this is quite flat and you have far more interesting colors and textures within the carnation themselves and again this would work really well alongside it because you get a flat glossy texture alongside that more fussy patterned gerbera. Right, now if we look at the iris, so this is iris reticulata, this is one from my garden, and um, if we look at this one, visually it's much softer, it looks delicate, um, it is delicate, it's just a coincidence, the iris is really quite soft and fragile. So the actual appearance is delicate, and soft and the visual appearance of this one is the same for this example it's quite soft and quite delicate as well very fragile little flower sometimes can be a bit hard to work with when we've cut them down short but a gorgeous gorgeous color link to create that complementary color harmony of the orange and blue together 
And again, if you're learning about texture and you are struggling to understand how texture works alongside one another, you need to start looking at still life paintings or still life flower arrangements. Because in still life, there maybe might be three or four inanimate objects in the picture. It could be a peach, a glass vase, and maybe a box. Each of those items have different texture and the artist has to be able to create the texture by painting using light and dark shades and light and dark to create shadows and um, it's, it's really a fascinating subject to look at. So if you're studying and you're new to floristry or flower arranging, have a look, little look at still lives and you will learn a great deal about texture and textural quality. Now we're going to have a look at space and a lot of the designs I've created on the YouTube videos I encourage you to have space within the flowers and again if we look at this um, peace lily and I just hold it up at this position here there is space through the flower or the plant I should say through the plant so if we hold it up we can still see the wall behind it if I bring it a bit closer to the camera there is space between the flowers and the leaf stalks so it's um, so within this plant itself we have lots of negative space around the flowers we don't have so much on the bottom part of the flower but the top section there is negative space there around each flower so negative space means there is nothing in the gap there is a hole or a void, the space is empty. Whereas positive space is more this bottom section here, or even where my hand is holding the container. The positive space is when the gap is filled, when there is something in the space, and the space basically is occupied. And in traditional style of flower arranging, we use far more negative space. Now, if I go back to this, um, cactus here. So if we look at the centre here of this cactus then we refer to that as positive space because that whole section is filled in in the centre and that leads quite well to the arrangement that I've made here on the side. I'm just going to pull it back so you can see it more clearly in the camera um, and I'll tip it forward. We might get some leakage of water again but we'll tip it right forward for you to see. Now if we look at this design, there are no gaps within this flower arrangement. Every gap within that rectangular shape is filled with flowers or foliage. So for this style of design, what we refer to as a group, uh, grouped and textured flower arrangement, we fill in every gap and we don't have any space within it. So this style of arranging doesn't have any negative space, it just has Flowers fill in each gap and each void, which becomes positive space. It's quite hard, I think, if you're learning to understand. Um, if I, for argument's sake, take out this rose here in the middle, then I would have quite a large gap here, and that would become negative space. But for a group design, we have to fill in the whole section of the design, to make the outlines shape or really clear and you'll see a lot of this type of work done in floristry funeral work where we do based hearts, based cushions, crosses, the lettering on um, tributes like dad or mum, that's all positive space, that's all where the gap and the space is completely occupied. Um, so a bit different to what we've done before but hopefully it's a good example of understanding positive space and I'm hoping that this design makes it more clearer to those that are possibly struggling with negative and positive space. Now the final one I'm going to talk about in the elements of design is line and we've looked at line before but I often talk about line as in the individual flower type. So this is the bulrush and it makes your eye travel up and down. Other examples of line in flowers are good, good summer flowers. So we can think of lupins, larkspur, stock, 
antirhinums, they all make your eye travel up and down. Lots of flowers um, available at the moment, so we're in June now, are great examples of lime. So there's delphiniums, foxglove, stock, antirhinum, anything that has that nice tall linear um, spike effect to the flower. So the eagle-eyed ones amongst you might have noticed that I don't have any examples of spike flowers in this, so no point flowers. Um, everything that I've got in here is almost a round shape or gives the appearance of a round shape. And that's because this grouped style of arranging looks much better when we have round shapes within the design. So I've avoided anything that's going to make your eye travel upwards because it spoils the overall shape and the overall style of the arrangement. Um, it's almost like um, a tapestry or a carpet sort of effect. We've embedded all the flowers very close to one another to create a very compact flower arrangement. But we have got, so even though I don't have line material um, as in the shape of the flower, I do have what we refer to as visual line. And visual line is what makes your eye move from one side of the flower arrangement to the other. It's almost like a pathway, like a visual pathway. And I created that by using the colour and the shape and the texture on both sides of the design so that your eye travels from one side to the other. So we pick up this very soft apricot peachy rose then we move to the next one and we move to the next one until we go to the opposite end. Then we pick up something that's the blue and our eye brings us back the opposite way and leads us to the shape of the gerbera. And then our eye rhythmically works its way back to the other side of the design. So when you're creating this type of arrangement, you need to think about making your eye move from one way to the other. And again, I often say if you split your design in half to make it visually attractive on both sides and visually balanced on both sides, we should have roughly the same colours and flower combination on one side and on the other. But we're not repeating it to make a symmetrical design on either side. We're just making the eye very casually move from one side to the other. And hopefully you've achieved visual line which is not easy to do when you're learning. Quite often you want things to be matching on both sides and you want things to look symmetrical. Um, one area we use this design in a lot is down the centre of trestle tables. So it's quite a narrow design. So if you can imagine that in the centre of a wedding trestle table or a very long banqueting room, we would do a continuous line of these designs down the middle repeating that colour all the way down and then you would have a continuous flower arrangement all the way down the length of a table and it can look really quite striking and very attractive. Okay so hopefully that's the end of sort of today's little chatty vlog and um, hopefully that's given you a more clear understanding of the elements of design. Now I haven't spoken today about the principles of design um, the principles of design tend to relate to the elements, so we'll look at that again in another video, otherwise ooh, it's a little bit too much for you to take in all in one go. Um, again, if you've got any questions, please ask them in the comment box below. If you haven't already subscribed to the channel, please do hit the subscribe button, it doesn't cost you anything at all. If you want to be notified every time I upload a new video, then you can click on the little bell icon as well. And I look forward to seeing you all again very soon. So bye for now, have a great few days and we'll see you all again very soon.